So if you build the muscle to be sad, you flip it. Sadness is your superpower. Sadness is your gift. You're, if you own your sadness, you're owning your capacity to change. You're owning excess reality and truth dumped into you. Which means it's going to take a lot of work to sort through all the excess truth and reality that's been dumped onto you, scapegoated onto you. But if you sort it out, now you can use that sadness to just move gravity. Sadness is weight. Sadness connects to your soul. Sadness would allow you to just own space or create space out of nothingness or something. You need someone to be a sadness master. I'm in sad baby mode today because I thought that I had learned a lot and advanced and I was just creating protective shields for the future based on mistakes I've done in the past. So with the Amber Heard thing, watching that, and then I kind of got frustrated with, oh, wow, like these people are so advanced with the way they behave. And I felt like I'll never catch up, created despair. So I broke down all the way down to square one. So right now I'm at square one, starting all over again. I knew nothing of what I thought I knew in the past. And it makes me super fucking sad. Uh, and I'm sitting right now as I speak in that sadness. Um, my, you can even hear it in my voice. Like I'm not a neocon today like I am normally am. Um, um very fucking sad um sad that i have to do i have to live in a world where we're sitting in this group and studying human beings that are built for torture and destruction and annihilation i wake up every day and that's the last thing on my mind i'm looking for a world of peace and love, that's not, that's my fantasy. That's not gonna happen. There are people out there to take my peace and love and weaponize it and strangle me and rip me to shreds. The fun part is there's nothing I can fucking do about it. And that's sad. I am sad. You need someone to be a sadness master. I'm just sitting with it. That's it. That's all I can do. Misery is a doorway. Maybe, hopefully, some enlightenment will come beyond the sadness. But for now, I am sad. I fully own it. Misery is a doorway. Misery is a doorway. And then, I just want to say, fuck the world, man. Right now, that's how I feel. Fuck the world. Fuck it. I didn't ask for this shit. Misery is a doorway. I didn't come here to work this fucking hard just to be alive and go about my business. So fuck it, um, uh, you know, it's okay. <sighs> Jesus fucking Christ, man. <clears throat> Life is about misery. Yeah, Your misery, amazing. other person's misery, it's all misery. You need someone to be a sadness master. This is so cool. <laughs> I remember he hearing Gangaji's partner, who's also in non-duality. Let me look up what his name is. Eli Jackson Dare. And he had a similar theory like terror management theory. 
that if you go down to the bottom, the bottom is despair. <laughs> That's just a start. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Oh. Those people chasing happiness and get the transcendent little hack and they think despair is the bottom. That might be the start where the words stop. Language stops and then things fall apart after that, but there's a lot of layers after language. And your maps fall apart. Misery is a doorway. <laughs> Man, all, all my maps are shit. I'm fucked up. <laughs> You're burning in that flame behind you, man. Uh, all, all of the fucking maps. All, yeah. the, all the diagrams. All that shit is burning right behind you. And you know you what? Right there and you know what? And you know what? And you know what? And you know One of these fucking bastards on this call dived in to rescue you. What a bunch of assholes. <laughs> Maybe there is progress then. Somewhere. Thank you. Exactly. No rescue. Right, and and that's uh, and and that's the thing. And like, that's not that's respect and honor, and that right, right. Like I, I'm, I am sad, you know. So it's yeah. like that's, but the fact that and the no reason one. why there's no rescue is that I'm not dumping it indirectly no, I mean, or I'm... directly on on you. Uh, like it's my own responsibility. You're owning this it. It's my. I'm You're owning, owning it. it. And we're not it picking is it my up. My sadness. And, and you of, know, right? There's a. There's also a. We're not picking it up because right. it, I think it would be disrespectful to do so, right. and would stop your process and interrupt. And we're not. That's right. Yeah. And um. Yeah. And it, there's. Sorry, that's progress. Progress. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. just there like i would just feel it in my stomach and my chest my throat like it's just sadness it's not pfft. um i refuse to intellectualize it i'm not gonna i'm not looking for answers i'm i'm just what is this this sad fucking dark cloud let it be let, yeah, just that's how i'm feeling and it, Good. And again, maybe th there is something to learn from it, but I'll allow it to teach me what it's supposed to. <sighs> yeah. But I, I do understand the frustration of watching Frank's shield which is something I think by now we're used to, <laughs> you know, like watching Frank show because Frank is, his, he is sad, but I think he's afraid to say I'm sad because if you weren't sad, you wouldn't tell that fucking story. That's how I would know like, oh, you're not sad, but you told a, a story and then you turned into, you went into a phone booth, turned into Superman from Clark Kent to Superman, and you're fluctuating between the two characters. And that's why someone put split in the comments. Because we can see, you were asking like, what do we see? We can see through that. There's sadness there, but you are purposely refusing to embrace it because you think it'll kill you. But it's not, it's, and that's why I said, you know, maybe in time, in due time, you'll embrace the sadness eventually. And, you know, but it's not, nothing we say will change that right now. In my opinion, at least. And I know yeah, this. Come on. We're better. We're, we can be killjoys. Come on. Why are you so down on our ability to evoke sadness in people? We can do better. <laughs> Shit. 
Sadness is wonderful. It's freeing. Yes, at it's first pure. everything falls apart. It is. And it is. It's pure. It's and horrible. It's, and it's disorienting. And yes, you no. feel like you're dying. It's, but it's, it's wonderful. A, I mean, that's why it's a tough sell. Right. <laughs> it feels great, though. Look at what you're missing out on, Frank. <laughs> It feels yeah. super great to know, to say, you know, all this stuff I learned, I know nothing. Gone. 2000, 2020 to 2022, gone. I lost those files. Done. There is no hope. There is no fantasy to make up. You're not catching up with shit. Start all over again. Let's start again. Fucking awesome place to be. Any kind of, well, isn't that everything I'm trying to understand? Everything was in your head. You said in your head, I got the maps, I'm doing well, I can nope. see stuff. And now you are saying the uh, same thing in your head. I got nothing else. I have nothing. I start from zero. Everything there was just, there was no. The maps, the maps was a defense mechanism, it was okay. an injunction. I'm trying to avoid things from happening in the future. So I'm studying the maps to protect me. And I built a false shield even while I thought I was advancing. So today I found out that's what I was doing and sadness fell over me. And that's why I'm sitting in the sadness. And for the first time I'm accepting the sadness and saying sadness, be my guide now. I'm not going to fight you. I'm, I'm just, I am, you know, I know nothing. Surrender. Yeah, surrender. It's lovely. Right. And I, I am sad. It's, you know, like my chest is heavy. Yeah. My throat yeah. is heavy. I was supposed to go out afterwards. I, I don't feel like it. So, yeah, and that's still me allowing the sadness because if I went out tonight, I would have masked the sadness. And um, no offense, I would look like Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, Frankie. Hey, man. <laughs> You're my dude. <laughs> well, I, would, I would, you know, be posturing like how, you know, what he's doing. You know, I would do that by going out and masking it. But I'd rather sit and then also use this opportunity to really, being that this is a container for me for, to do that and use this opportunity tonight. There'll be other nights to go out, but tonight is mm -hmm. sadness night. Okay. Sadness is like, I'm here. And I burnt and destroyed all your so-called maps. Now what? And instead of fighting that, I say, okay. Okay, you got it. And, but sadness also says, I'll tell you what's next when I'm ready. And that's mm. what I'm here for. That's what I'm waiting for. But Ania Khan has set the standard now for the rest of the group. <laughs> I haven't said shit. That's just well, I tell you what. Like... I mean, it was, we had a good run. We had a good run, Vissel Gravitas and I, but. <laughs> no, no standards. <laughs> so that's just why it's got I'm into a ditch up. now, man. It's got into it. <laughs> it's over. The last. Gonna be a sad group and nothing else. If you don't turn up, that is interesting. Just... Yeah, Ania can't hit that with Amber Heard death and that. But Ania, uh, Anna Akana, she sort of covered the the hurt. I think in this video, I haven't seen it in a while.
In an almost relationship, we don't get that kind of closure. We just have the fantasy version in our heads of what it could have been. And any fantasy is going to be infinitely better than whatever the realistic relationship would have looked like. This is why it hurts so bad. We're mourning an idyllic dream version of us. Not to mention the pain of rejection, the daunting task of having to find new connection, the re-emergence of loneliness, and any self-esteem issues this rupture may have caused. So how do you mourn a relationship you never had? Well, what we're really mourning is the dream. The dream that that the person dream. represented. It's not about them. But also your childhood doesn't have to be a love partner. A shared fantasy. It's about you. So remember, even though that person is no longer part of the equation, the dream is still alive. And also the old Jew. This is why it hurts so bad. We're mourning an idyllic dream version of us. And this is sort of Granin's weak point. He's had a couple of the videos about despair and grief. He's also openly said never again. <laughs> and that tortures and keep him, keeps him trapped in the past because of that never again posture. So Anita Khan's passing Richard Brennan. <laughs> All because of Amber Heard. I'll give her credit. Definitely. Uh, I would definitely give her credit. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. It almost feels like a drug, like you're on drugs. Like you're so heavy hearted. That, and you can feel it, it's numbing. Especially when you allow it to function without blocking it. It's numbing. Yeah, I, I feel drowsy. Is it, do you feel heavier or lighter? Heavier. Do you feel more weight? Mm hmm And, um, would you say you're more grounded or dissociated? No, I'm more grounded because I, I can. I, I can. Are you doing breathing exercises and other hacks to ground yourself? <laughs> breathing exercises, yeah, I've been doing those. <laughs> but, no, no, it's, it's easy. Just... It's natural. You don't need all these embodiment bullshit practice. You just need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To own your sadness. Just bring stay down down head. Right. You make it sound easy, Dave. Just it is. It's just horrible. Yeah. I'll get there. I'll get there. Yeah. Just a tough sell. Right? It, it, it actually you, it you actually too is. could be Frank, you you too could be as miserable as an aircon if you just tried hard enough, right? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't want this? Right. But what it's funny in there, what I get from, oh, what's the word? I'll, I'll get the word, but it's like um, a deep seriousness. Yeah. There's a, it's not gravitas, because that's what this is called, but uh, what's the word? Re reven reverence is the word I'm looking for. Reverence. Hmm. Or grave. Yeah, gravity in the sense of that level of seriousness. It was real. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Respect. I I really you know it's it's embarrassing uh, a little bit because you know I felt like I was catching up learning and then you just you know one incident boom 
blown to shreds. Like you thought you, what did you know? What do you think you knew? And they're like, no, there's some things you're suppressing. And I'm like, damn. Hmm. But um, yeah, like I said, I, I feel like the sadness is, yeah, it's just a new chapter and I'm just leaving it be for the first time and just allowing to feel that. I don't even want to say, oh, it'll, I'll feel better later. I don't know. So I'm uncertain. I, I don't know, but that's where I want to work. I want, it's a new angle that I'm working from. So I'm working from, I don't know. I'm so used to knowing. I was kind of fooled by what I do as well. As an artist, I plan out the thumbnails and then build a case and then build a focal point and then build that. And I've been using that model. I guess this sadness is saying, fuck that. To start something new. But whatever it brings to me as the new way, I'll accept it instead of pretending, posturing behind what, whatever the intellectual things I'm building mm -hmm. to, to control, to be in control. I don't want to be in control anymore. I'm done. I'm fucking tired of being in control. Let the chaos begin. I don't care. That is the sadness I'm feeling. I don't want to know. And I don't know. And it's sad because I would, um, I've been trained to know. And now I realize today, I don't know. Man, that's scary. It's a, an existential, an existential seismic shift of okay. unknowing. Yeah, but I, usually you would. It, what's interesting that he has this mirror within himself. You know, uh, it's not like there was a, some action where he realized. You know, it bounced. Oh, you know, this is what I got from this mirror. It wasn't anybody else. It was all within him. Oh, I am hot shit. I know everything. And then there's something happened again within him. There was no interaction outside of him. Within him, again, there was that mirror which says, oh, I, had, I know nothing now. I usually get more insights in, from other people. In the interaction. In interactions. Yeah. Oh. But that's me. It's fine. It's just, that's me. I think this one is at the at more core. Uh -huh. You have to uh -huh. see yourself there. So um, I was just feeling like the sadness is in the ears kind of thing. Um, and being a model maker, I was just thinking, is it to do with the solstice and all that shit? You know, special one or two days has been stupid. But yesterday, I watched a movie called Luana. Have you guys seen Luana? It's like a Disney and I saw that with the kids about six months ago. We were laughing. And it was like she has, there's a scene in which she has to, she, she, she sees the ocean and it has to be traversed. There's something else at the end of that ocean. And she gets this canoe and goes for it by herself. And it was like, yeah, girl, here you go. That was a feeling six months ago I was playing. But yesterday I saw it, I just became so sad. It was like, oh. And I was watching the kids and I said, you have to all go through that. I'm still guy trying to go through that. And in the movies, you, you, you make it. But where is that island? You see, it was this journey. Uh, and you can feel the calling. You can feel, the, and that's what I'm hearing in yours, uh, Anaka, the calling. And then you have to surrender to that kind of, a, but it's like this sad space. Just went to the butt. Uh, you know, it was a fun movie, but it, like, what's there to cry about? But it was just, I had to go to the bathroom and I just sat there for like 10 minutes. I just felt, fuck. Just... And there's a lava song about the mountain, the lava. 
And he says, you know, I'm growing old. And I was just fucking weeping inside. I said, shit, it's like this. And there's this other lava at the bottom of the sea that sort of rises up. And I said, fuck. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a painful mm. realization. But that's weird. It, there was no feeling to move away from it. It was just, yeah, right right now it's it's there. But it's like... Yeah, it's there. I'm not, you know, I've been feeling it since the in-person meeting and I, I don't feel, um, you know, of course I got um, a lot of support from the group um, then. And then now, you know, like um, I'm just reflecting because I, I'm watching Frank go through it, yeah. uh, Frankie go through it, and um, how everybody's trying to save him and sometimes, you know, pushing him. And of course, we learn from him as well and then learn to <laughs> fall back. But um, there's a tendency to claim, while you claim you know what the problem is and what the shields are, you end up using <laughs> the knowledge from this group as a shield as well. Mm -hmm. And this is why my shield from this, all the stuff I've been learning had to shatter to start all over again from not knowing. And um, it, it doesn't um, feel good to not know. So um, I don't have a map. I don't have a diagram, you know? I'm used to oh, diagrams. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> Aunties, mate. Fuck man. diagrams. Aunties. I'm used, I'm used to having diagrams, man. There is none. It's broken, shattered. So last night I was um, thinking about this feeling this and it was like uh, the diagram and models and answers is the hero's journey kind of thing. Right. And so <clears throat> that's there, but this is like a soul's, the hero's journey. And that is with vulnerability and other stuff, which, which the hero just does not get, doesn't like that shit. Yeah. So it's the I was other just, I was I was just working on this, right? So this is like the hero's journey thing where it's like, um, I guess, meeting with the goddess where you find yourself. So I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, the shark. But, um, the, the shark yeah, it's yeah. like sharks at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. Uncer uncertainty. And yep. then the idea, like the sword and the pencil being the shield I created in terms yep. of my knowledge. And then, of <laughs> course, the baby. baby representing, yeah. So, like, um, yeah, this is, I think Deef kind of discussed it. We discussed this, like Deef said, the sadness sometimes can turn into creativity. So mm -hmm. it's like, I've already been feeling sad while I was working. I'm, 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 I'm building this piece. And then finally today, it's like, boom, you know, like it exploded. <laughs> You know, when you showed that, I like, you know, the image that came to my mind, the opposite of that was this kid like this and waiting for the vultures to bite, bite you, to kill you, just like this. <laughs> like a total um, Look at uh, visualizations. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Pankaj thinks he's in the Alfred cop movie, the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's, it's that the yeah. capacity to accept that vulnerability and mm -hmm. say, yeah, it's that's what has to be done. But that's that's the beauty, that's the thing that yeah. I think Deef, when Deep says it's beautiful, you know, that it is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You know, because you feel this Who way. You want to be pecked then, to death. I mean, really, come on. Not in podcast uh, <laughs> <laughs> visuals. <laughs> no, but um just feeling the pain allowing it and then seeing what comes out the other side without knowing the outcome yeah. yourself. It's so really, and, yeah. and again, like it's funny, I've been creating this piece over and over, you know, correcting it, adding stuff and kind of, you know, but it was, I think that piece, I was already sad, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's like building 
<laughs> that, you know, and that's why the woman is delicately holding the baby and then the sharks and which represents my fuck the world kind of, you know, because that's the way I see the world. It's like sharks ready to, you know, but then there's this confidence and then the shield with the swords in the back, like I got this, but not really. <laughs> and the swords, you know, again, like it, it's like the my tools of choice. So the actual sword represents the angry baby and this represents the art, the creates creative part. So there's kind of like a balance of that, but then, you know, the baby and then all these, like the branch of the crazy shit going on with the sharks and stuff. Yeah. And so I'm like, yeah, this makes sense now. Yeah. And so now uh, what I'm feeling now is I'm, I'm getting a little bit lighter now. Mm. I don't know why. So I'm getting a little bit more like, okay. So I think this piece, I need to put more focus in it and kind of use this piece to creatively to guide me through the sadness. Yeah. It reminds me of that novel, of the, the Fawn Birds. So it's like a story in which there's... Ah. Like Colleen McCulloch. Yes. The priest who wants order, you know, like truth, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's this metaphor of this bird that will, you know, sit on the thorn to cut the throat. And that's when the beautiful sound comes. So what was the part of the in-person? Was it the futility of the circular arguments that I illustrated, or was it the seeing it illustrated by Amber Heard and Johnny Depp uh, describing? It, or? it was, um, you know, like just the breakdown and finding out that, you know, like watching Amber Heard and listening to the way she was talking and knowing like this is who she is and she's that good <laughs> so i'm sitting here like i'm trying to build a strategy to go against that <laughs> yeah, you, know, it's like, you know and it's like i don't not only do i not feel like i don't feel like going against that and and then I'm like, why do I have to go against that? And the sadness and despair started. Like, I thought I knew how to go against that. And then it's like, I don't know how to go against that. And I'm frustrated. Mm -hmm. And so it just spiraled into, but I didn't know how to express. Like, I didn't know that sadness was the thing coming out of that, like was sprouting out of these feelings. So thanks to like you later on, you know, after the meeting, we talked and as we were talking and then you pulled it and you said, okay, so sadness, you're feeling sad. And then I was able to see in that moment, like, oh yeah, that's it, exactly. I feel sad, like, but the sadness has to do with not having control over what happens in the future with all these learning things and learning defenses mm -hmm. how to get back and you know so it's like oh yeah i don't i feel like you know i think i said this i feel like uh it shoot it shot me back to boarding school where it's like oh yeah you can now you have to learn physics chemistry and all this other shit and it's like oh fuck like i, I can't make these complicated ca calculations like yeah and so I went back to that and I was like, oh. Uh, and it's funny how those things spiral into what it is. Like it started from Ember Heard's word salad to <laughs> like, the, yeah, the sadness coming out of that is. Hmm. Yeah, it's just a mystery to me. So again, I'm not trying to resolve mm. the mystery. I was really astonished by the fact that blaming my mom was scapegoating her. I thought, oh, yeah, 
I'm doing that. Mm. It's not yeah. only scapegoating her, you're giving up your power. Yeah, it's true. I feel huge relief when I can tell at least a bit of the story of to make sense of it and to confirm for myself that because sometimes I still have this idea that it's not true or that it didn't happen. So mm -hmm. I also need to hear myself saying it, feeling it, because I sh silence myself for as long as I can remember. So I think it's double. It's telling and recognizing it and um, acknowledging it. And then I don't need to blame her. No? But I do at this moment. I'm <laughs> fucking angry and pissed off with her. Yeah. It's part of the journey, but ultimately, oh. it's there's greater forces at play. So in the old days, you just put it in God's hand or blame God or blame fate. But choosing one person is playing God yourself by putting all the cause at one person. Mm -hmm. But then you're also putting the cause at them to fix it. Or your resentment very easy to fall into that. Mm. And they, they become your God because they, they had all the power. So um... Yes, that's where you give up your power. You want them to see you or acknowledge it. Or you want them to acknowledge it, but then then you get sad when you realize they don't even see you. <laughs> or you've been dealing with a ghost, your projection. Your fantasy falls apart, and that's yeah, uh, very sad. Yeah, very painful. Yeah, that's part of the despair today when we were discussing it because you want to don't fuck with me like that. You know, I didn't ask for it. You know, like I, I'm just minding my business and you're trying to jab and I, I have enough like the fucking storm breaker to dice you up into pieces through like that rage uh, of, you know, but <laughs> today it's like, I found out, like, yeah, but that's what they want, though. And it's a win-win. <laughs> so you didn't do shit. That's beautiful. That's you beautiful. lash out at them, they win. You don't, they win. But, you know, so I'm like, okay, what do you do? And that's where I said, I don't know. And the sadness kicked in, you know, where it's like, I thought I knew what to do. And it's like, oh, fuck. Well, that's right. the and that's bullshit, setting boundaries bullshit. Right. And that's why now it's like, okay, square one, let's go back to square one. But it does feel good to know that I have a blank slate now to, for lack of a better word, a blank canvas to start with. You know, although, <laughs> I, hate using, I hate using that fucking term. That but, is uh, such a bad metaphor uh, for you. <laughs> but, yeah, but uh, it's so cliche. But um, yeah, but it, you... You know, it's like starting all over again doesn't feel that bad. Uh, you know, just a different strategy. And I have a feeling like I just feel like, yeah, there is something that it, there's something to learn. And I'm just now like, oh, I wonder what I'm going to learn from this. It's like someone who's not expressing their feelings, but are able to transfer it into other people to feel it. So if I'm feeling rage, I'm like, hey, I'm not angry, man. I'm just trying to have a conversation. Meanwhile, you're furious. Like, no, you're not. You're talking in circles and I'm, I win. But then at the same time, if you, <laughs> if you try to help me with that conversation, then I win also because I've fooled you into thinking that I really want to have a conversation. And then I'm like, what do you? The only thing I can think about in that moment is like, I want to punch your fucking head off your shoulders. How about that? You know, and we even, but what is that going to do? Makes them win again. Also, <laughs> yes. So you become, it's this cycle yeah. of like, so, you're not going to win. Like, it's just that. Or it's so, because then it becomes a pissing competition about who's right. going to win and who's going to lose. Exactly. 
But if you take someone's suffering away, you're stealing their life experience. That's also a truth. I agree with that. I think it's a very salient point. It's abusive to take their suffering away from them. Maybe they miss out on something that they would have learned or should have you're learned. You're stealing, yeah. You're stealing their pain. You're stealing their potential life changing experience mm -hmm. by you preemptively jumping in and altering, altering their course of life, altering God's grace. You are putting yourself in front of destiny. For what? A cheap fix? Let me give some advice that make me feel good for a day or two. And but I still it's always afraid to like try to do like inner child work because what if something doesn't happen? The sadness for your littles. Blima. Well, it's easier to give sadness, like, then, then we get, like, uh, that's how we get caught up in being codependent. It's easier to be sad for the other person rather than ourselves. Like, even feeling sad for someone that's, like, for me, I feel like I'm giving away my energy of sadness for someone else instead of for myself. Mm. That's covering up me like that energy I, 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 I feel that because that's why it's like this um the smile and all that the fake mm -hmm. smile all that because it's you're not important you're not uh, relevant it's for other people right and other people would come and ask for it yeah if if i let them that is so fucking sad i, I don't matter it don't matter. That is so fucking sad. It don't matter. So you think you're a coward to the sister who's thrilled or the mom? What? It's been a coward, man. So then that's shame also. So you assessing your character with judgment. So there's judgment silence and secrecy no but are you responsible for them i mean do you have to be their hero it's not the issue holly it's just this is what i am actually feeling so that's all technical and in the head yeah. so if it were to happen again how would you respond yes if it happened again I'm used to the tantrum now, and it's it's my my stomach is all churning. But I I will stand up and I say no, no fucking way. Yeah, I'll do that now. I know that. So I know that now. Okay, what's this? I think we, he mentioned guilt, but I think it's more shame. Mm. So the blame and guilt is about doing stuff in the future. Holly, you just asked next time, how would you handle? Seems like he's not confused about the future, the blame, the guilt. He's more concerned about judging his character, being a, a coward. That's judgment. And then in the past, he was a coward because he silenced his intuition. And under the carpet, he put it under secrecy. So your issue is more shame that you use secrecy, silence, and judgment. to shame, to cover up your intuition. So the shame covered up your cowardice too. So now your cowardice is coming out and you don't like seeing how you were a coward because that's a character hit. That's not honorable. So the positive side of shame is honor. So you are seeing how you were dishonorable, but, a coward. But it, was this, but it was like this crazy thing that that is what's honorable is to just not talk about it because that's yes, what the bigger it is that's what a bigger but, my or big heart does but now do you think it's honorable or you think it's a coward <laughs> it fucking is honorable to fucking call it out mm -hmm. so this is a time for you to build character or use this experience to 
expand your character because you feel like a coward or you feel what is honorable what are your values you have to fix that you have to update that yeah and if it goes against your culture yeah, are you prepared to do that just, sorry holly are you if it goes against your culture are you prepared to do that yeah, I'm a bit of a rebel to a point, but in the deeper place, like kindness was the highest place of character, kindness and acceptance and... Um, you can speak the truth in love. Not honesty. That's deception. the thing, you mentioned that once before, yes. Is so deception yes. Uh, higher than truth, if it's more kind? Yep. <laughs> So now it is uh, about transparency, integrity. And Can you see what's on the other side there, Tief? Your head is blocking it. Oh. Adulting. That's the more positive side. Adulting versus smothering. So this is a smothering side. So if you're on the adulting side, courage and attention to stand up for what's right or stand up for your values figure out your values what are your values is it more truth or is it more secrecy or is it how do you balance kindness with secrecy family secrets and transparency honesty integrity you've got to Take the lead with yourself, then you'll feel good about your character. Right now, you've seen your old character was not leading with discipline and self-leadership. You were caving to secrecy. That feels bad. Just to keep the family image intact. And it's it's really, I'm privileged to be, because it, it is... It, it's still a very, very good family, but there's all this other, there's enough stuff to, uh, it should have been called out, but it wasn't called out. And I'll, I'll... Can I ask a question? Yeah. Wasn't this all the work that your parents were supposed to do to discipline your brother and, you know? And how do you feel about being the one with this wisdom and not your parents? I, what can I say? I, I feel sometimes I have to explain this stuff to them, but I, you know, like they get, they're quite elder now, but it's like, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's since when I was very young, I, I felt like I, I'm the I'm, I'm having to sometimes keep the peace with mum and dad because mum's very emotional and dad is very so. so doesn't that dump the responsibility to discipline your brother on you like, who's going to discipline brother I'm the one who is doing it, and my sister is there. My sister, but my mum caves in, and and then she just falls for the grandkids. She wants to see them, you see. So, um, this brother, the youngest brother in question, was trying to make a, some sort of a deal that will have. You know, you can see them on Zoom, but as long as you apologize uh, and do this and do that for some shit, what the fuck? It's like. The reverse spectrum, there's a thing for the reverse something. And then I sort of I said, this is classic and this is all happening all my life, but I never saw it and I didn't have a model or didn't have the language for it. And so I'm just spinning. So how can you discipline them when your parents are still alive? How can you discipline your brother when your parents are still alive? They're still letting him get away with this stuff and they have the authority over him. How can you discipline your brother? 
And I'm not telling you to. I'm asking you if that's your objective. How do you accomplish that? I think I'm, I'm not focused or centered on disciplining him. It is just using that, uh, because it, this whole thing started more when this happened, and I got more interested in understanding all this stuff. But it's just to True. understand myself and like um, just hold him accountable for what he's done, because my uncle had done it. One of my uncles had done it ages ago. Um, and no one called him out. And I knew my eldest uncle suffered. He suffered because he, he had made plans for something. And so it was to call him out more, Holly. It's like, fuck, this is not on. And but I, was, I remember when I was deciding to do that, I was so scared. I, I was feeling awful about it. You know, I was feeling like uh, this is not good, but I knew it was good, but I, I could not, uh, like that thing you're saying, which is a bit of values. So it's it, it's just bullshit values, you know, just pick them up. Mm -hmm. Just be happy, be kind, and let's just get along. And, and, and that's the value. That's the main value in my family. Let's be happy. Let's go out and have a good time, enjoy. Um, and if there's some, something... Just put it under the carpet and repeat. Okay. Does it make sense? So, yeah. So if he's not affecting, okay, so he may attack you. Does he attack your kids or your wife? Because that's your family now. That's your family. No. Your family no, is yours. They hardly, we, have, we have hardly interacted, but in the last few years, but he would have, he's attacked my sister. And he's attacked my parents. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are they grown up now? Is your sister grown up now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Got kids and everything. She's smart. Everyone's adults. Yeah, all well, everyone's adults. Yeah. So if they're adults, why are you jumping in to rescue them? Um, that's not the main focus to rescue. It is just that if some shit's happening around you, you you're not you're not centered around it, but you just say this is bullshit. No. Yeah, but if he's not attacking you, then why do you need to say anything about him attacking somebody else and among your siblings and your well, parents? He already did attack me. He he ripped me off with all the property. <laughs> yeah. 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 Calling out bad behavior. Because yes. they're a family system that interacts with each other. So that's destroying trust if somebody is yeah. doing bad behavior. So calling out the behavior is trying to Are you build trying trust. to build the trust? Are you trying do you think you trust? can have trust for him? Now that he's shown you his colors? Well, the family system has grandkids and other people, so this is not an easy cut off cut-off situation. Right, I'm not saying to cut off. Okay. What I'm saying so is then what? you have his what I'm saying is you have his number, you know? So I mean, I, I guess I, I, so is there opportunity for him to rip you off again? No. Like when your parents pass or you know, when there's a legacy that, that's due you? Are you afraid that he will rip you off again? Uh, no, the, uh, I'm not concerned as much about that because I think I've got enough uh, sensibility now to not uh, to be able to deal with that adequately. But I'm still in, oh, a timestamp, yes, because I'm still ruminating on things that I wasn't able to do in the past, and I'm not able to see I'm actually in the present because I'm not. That's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, you're not moving past that prior ripoff because that's gone, whatever that was. You're talking about timestamps. Okay. Huh? Go ahead, Dee. 
Do you feel these feelings of too much in the past? Regrets, sadness, bitterness. I feel sadness. And I don't think you should forgive him. If he hasn't made restitution for what he stole from you, there is no need for forgiveness. But right now, it's time to just see what the feelings are. We're trying to get the time signatures okay. right. I don't feel I can forgive. That's not a big... I don't feel bitter. Okay. Initially, I did, but now I feel sad. Okay. I don't have a grievance. Okay. I regret, okay. and I feel guilt that I should have done things, and I didn't do it. So... Explore these feelings and just sit with them. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. they're pulling you into the it. past because you have the time signature, you're noticing it's in the past. When you've sat with them long enough, then they'll naturally dissipate. But right now, you're being pulled into the past. Now you're back. Sadness, you regret. Me just wild. If, I, if I come too close, this damn connection cuts off. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'm just going to do this right now. Okay. Guilt. I'm guilty that I knew and I still didn't, didn't attend to it because... It would, I was too afraid to confront the pain of confronting it. So that was cowardice to confront. So I feel guilty for that. And I feel regret as well that if I had done this, it, it, there's other projects I want to do now. They were delayed by three years, two, year, two or three years. Mm -hmm. Lost opportunity. Lots of regret. My grievance is not with him because I understood, um, guys, that he uh, he will not get it. Because I, um, when I looked at our exchange, it's this soup. Yeah, um, I'm not diagnosed, but uh, it's it's narcissism, psychopathy, probably more, um, and is not able to self reflect. So this is the test I did in my head, if, if you have done anything wrong, he could never say I've done something wrong. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, it's not a concept like, uh, but if, I, if it was wrong, then why would I do it? Like that's what his answer is. Uh -huh. That's his answer in an email. <laughs> I asked him, is this, this is not a moral thing. And he said, well, if it is, because if it wasn't moral, why would I do it? And so I don't have a grievance with him, but I had a, I have a grievance with my other brother who was not able to hear my voice. So what actually I felt and what my what the rest of the family felt, because he's very much, he's like a tick box, you know, it was this, like he was probably a communicate, he, he was fixated on, oh, he didn't communicate properly and it was better communication, better manners, you know, that's what he's upset about. Um, but I then asked him, what about the conduct, the, the guts of it? And then I think I planted a seed at the end. But time will tell if it went in or not. Mm. But I think I did. So I have a grievance with him. I don't have a grievance with my dad because he also cannot self-reflect. He, he can't think that he could do something a different way. His answer is, if it was different than I, that was then, that's what I did. And this is what I do today. So it's like... Um, which was a shock to me. Like I thought he could self-reflect, but I realized he actually can't go outside and look at himself. It's like this, and I'm okay with that. So I have a grievance with my middle brother for that. I don't have a grievance with my mom, although she's the same. She's in her seventies. She's doing the best she can, but she's torn with the grandkids and this, and she hasn't done this other work to be able to so he, she just misses her son. You see what I mean? Like for her, mm -hmm. it's, it's your son, your, your, you know, your youngest son. So, and then um, they used to live next door to mom and dad. 
So their children used to come all the time, like for five years, like every day after they were one and a half, every day. And her wife, his wife is a classic BPD, like classic, classic, classic. So I've no grievance with them because I, 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 they're, they're that way. So that's, that's their nature, that's their dharma. Um, and sadness is more to do with why I couldn't do it earlier, but if I'm, I'm present here, so I'm getting confused with getting enmeshed with Ankaj five years ago or 10 years ago. You're getting That's confused? Why? why? Yeah, it's like, uh, without, because of that time signature thing, it seems like it, it's all permeating, but I get this now, so there's no need to be sad going forward. Yes, but if there's sadness still in your system, that means your past hasn't been in integrated. I'm only feeling a little bit better. That was then. It's sort of... Um, when you're orienting yourself in time, your attention will naturally jump to different future, past, now. You have to sort of let your attention goes where it go, goes where it goes. So if your attention is going into the past, follow your attention to the past first. If you fight your attention, it's just a waste of energy. You can do it temporarily, but if your attention is strong enough, it's pulling you into the past because these feelings haven't been fully felt and processed because there might be some extra wisdom or insights that your past is you're being pulled into the past because you need to spend more you need to care more about what these emotions are saying to you what the wisdom of them these emotions or maybe you need to these emotions are going to help you update your map so the more you stay in these emotions milk them, be compassionate with it, then naturally, once they're integrated, they're just... I'm also more feeling present. shame that I, I have this, I, I have a view of me that I'm quite smart, and I just did not get all this shit, like, it just, like, this is so basic. No, you're human. You'll be smart in some things, and you'll be stupid in other things. That's human. People see me as smart in one sector, and they don't give me space for being totally stupid in other sectors. Nobody gets to be smart everywhere. It just takes time. And if you wasted so much time already and you have regrets about so many years, what's a little more extra time? <laughs> so can you be present with the past? Only through misery can you reach bliss. So can you be present with the past? Spear is enlightenment. Holy fuck. How many years I've been paying for fucking therapy? God damn. Holy fuck. Why do you guys care so much? Why can't you enjoy people's misery? That's why we're here. Entertainment. <laughs> what do you think the purpose of life is? Life is about misery. 
Yeah, your misery, be... other person's misery. It's all misery. How you can dump your misery onto someone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can you be more creative with misery? Only through misery can you reach bliss. Misery is a doorway. Just like pain is a portal to consciousness. And pain equals pleasure. Misery equals bliss. Despair uh, equals enlightenment. Despair is enlightenment. Misery is a doorway. Holy fuck. Enlightenment. Uh, the self-hatred is really that big. Oh. Yeah, man. So, uh, it's kind of like screaming into an echo chamber. Um, it, yeah, I can say that. And it's like, I know logically it's true, but can never really act on it. Okay. It's like, I don't want to do well. Like I, I can't get myself to put effort into anything you know, that would advance my life forward. So I kind of keep myself stuck in the same place. Cause it's like, you know, why should I be able to like have a family or why should I be able to like be in a job where I feel like I'm respected or I, in a way, I feel like I'm kind of where I should be. Um, even though it's, like hurting me as far as I can tell, because I just didn't like myself. It, it was never fun, like drinking. I never had fun being drunk or being stoned or it was just what I did. There's this hatred, some sort of hatred issue. And then Chantel sort of opened that up. But if you were able to be that precise, what is the hatred if you're able to see things that clearly? Uh, I don't feel like I'm living up to my potential, I guess. It's probably the best way I could put it. But can't like push myself to take the steps necessary. So I just feel like kind of a lazy fuck. So it's like diagnosing disease, but like not willing to like treat it. And I can't explain why not. Like, like I know what I need to do, but can't bring myself to do it. And I can't figure out if that's just like laziness or something, some other shit. So, yeah. Well, it's all the fixation with um, how self-hatred works. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you guys worried that it might be contagious if you figure out how it works? I don't even know if like trying to figure out the cause for it would even be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Just trying to sort of move past it at this point. Because honestly, I, I think you, you can just tell from looking at me, thinking about this is just intensifying it. <laughs> Brings it into focus. And, uh... Pain could be a portal to consciousness. It's a nice saying. <laughs> that is it might be hard to apply. <laughs> that, that, that is the thing, eh? And we don't want pain, so remain a fucking bozo. <laughs> yeah, pain just might be an amplifier. Strong. Maybe it's not even pain. It's just too much. <laughs> it's a hyper focus energy. Just 
stresses the limits of your mind and your language and your understanding. That's all it is. <laughs> but then your mind and your ego sees it as a threat. <laughs> there's no models. We don't have people that show us how to yeah. endure pain or build the capacity to to take in more pain. We have the opposite. That pain is something that we control and reject. And reject. Right. Yeah. How many people are taught to relax into pain, or write it out, or transmute it, or play with it? Yeah, when giving birth, a bit of that gets, See? yeah. So in the old days with midwives and a lot of female elders, there would have been a lot of initiated mothers, grandmothers who could model Relaxing in the pain, relaxing at that edge of birth and death. We don't have that anymore. Or it's a very small <laughs> wisdom tradition. So if it's that dormant for you for since 13 to now, maybe your body is now welcoming that initiation. Or it's ready to take on that gift. Yeah, it could be. Pain is also a softening energy, isn't it? So people who live with chronic pain, they've been forced to embrace more humanity. To be humbled. Yes, absolutely. To be broken again and again and again and not fucking die. That kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. You're not afraid but of we dying. We don't honor that. That was part of those Christian people that whipped themselves to try to <laughs> recreate Christ mm. Jesus' suffering. <laughs> yeah. Because that pain is a type of asceticism <laughs> to transcend their ego, to build their spirituality or get closer to something. <laughs> I remember being a kid in India, maybe seven years old, and I'm watching these Muslim people. They've got like a, like a handle, and then there's a, like a metal chains and stuff, and they'll go like this, and it's done with a rhythm. And then something is said, and they go like this. And I remember back into their eyes, there's no pain. It's excitement and exhilaration. And then they go, there's a certain dust that they do. And I was a kid, and I, I, I didn't even feel, I saw the blood, like a little bit of blood, but it didn't feel awful to me. But it was like, uh, there was no pain on their faces. It was like uh, this kind of, yeah. Like some sort of cleansing, excitement. Mm -hmm. There might be an art or there might be a portal if you can concentrate your mind or mm. normalize the pain because the body has its natural adaptations. Then you can use a pain to get more into your body. That's the ascetic type practice and then you can now use that pain to build some sort of doorway maybe I don't haven't explored it to that much extreme stuff I can sort of see but something missing now because medicine and psychology everything's about comfort now opposite i get the feeling deep that it brings you closer to that uh feeling of i am i i i i exist like in in uh, really i i'm here that kind of thing I, and other things just don't do it oh it gets you it changes your sense of time time that's true and it's right it now hey 
right now. Of rules or everything else. So mm. if your if your system nervous system detects pain, it it will go with all the attention to that. All right the rest. Now. That's that's why people cut themselves because the pain will take on all the energy. I think if the pain is allowed to be processed or like if you're in a context where the, the pain is acceptable, like, but for instance, if your pain is an annoyance to everyone around you, or if you're like a parent looking at your kid and it's like a reminder that maybe you're not the best parent. And so they kind of suppress it, which is me trying thinking what sort of my parents were like, then you can't really process it all the way because you're not allowed to fully experience it. You just sort of bury it. That's the issue. Yeah. Trying to bury it, limit, bury it. contain the pain or suppress it, which creates a judgment of the pain or hatred, pain on pain, or inverted life force because the pain wants to be expressed or moved and you stop it. So then you have to go figure out more ways to try to end this stop life force, which leads you to addictions or suicidal drives and yes. <laughs> The pain is life force. The pain is charge. Yeah. It's the pure signal. It's the pure signal with no noise. Yeah, it becomes a source of shame. If it's... Uh, so well, then that's another yeah. way to contain the pain. Yeah. Use hatred and use shame to try to contain it. But that comes at a big price. Holy fuck. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> How many years I've been paying for fucking therapy? God damn. Because <laughs> that has a comfort bias. That has the language bias. That has the story narrative bias. Which doesn't make space for pain. Pain is the enemy. Pain is something that has to be. Yeah, it's treated as the disease and not really what's yes. really the the cure in a way, or maybe. Yeah. Maybe some sort of cure or it's not even a d disease. It's just yeah. pure attention, pure importance, pure present moment now urgency. Well, this explains why <laughs> I can't make myself cry. <laughs> Although right now I really want to. <laughs> There's a little more space. Exactly. Well, There's really not much to say about pain. It's just to recognize and honor its power. <laughs> The wisdom is in the pain. The, <laughs> the pain has all the everything that you need to know. There's any overlays of understanding or trying to mm. box it in. Just <laughs> That's our <laughs> hubris. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, yo. <laughs> the pain is life force. The pain is charge. It's the pure signal. It's the pure signal with no noise. Yeah, it becomes a source of shame. If it's... Uh, so well, then that's another yeah. way to contain the pain. Yeah. Use hatred and use shame to try to contain it. But that comes at a big price. Holy fuck. <laughs> yeah, bro. Ah. 
How many years I've been paying for fucking therapy? God damn. Because <laughs> that has a comfort bias. That has the language bias. That has the story narrative bias. Which doesn't make space for pain. Holy fuck. How many years I've been paying for fucking therapy? God damn. Holy fuck. Why do you guys care so much? Why can't you enjoy people's misery? That's why we're here. Entertainment. What do you think the purpose of life is? Happiness? Not enjoying someone else's misery. No. I'm sorry. I don't buy that. Life is about misery. Yeah, Your misery, other person's misery. It's all misery. How you can dump your misery onto someone else. Yeah. How can you be more creative with misery? Only through misery can you reach bliss. Misery is a doorway. Just like pain is a portal to consciousness. And pain equals pleasure. Misery equals bliss. Hey, yo. You know, when I'm... Despair uh, equals enlightenment. Despair is enlightenment. How can you be more creative with misery? Only through misery can you reach bliss. I saw, I saw, I actually saw this quote and it captured my attention. It says, to live is to suffer and to, su to survive is to find some meaning in the suffering. Yes, but Nia let me just say this. There's one kind of suffering, and then there's this kind of suffering. I don't want this one. I'll take this one. Give me heartbreak. Give me the this. Give me death. Give me... Uh, I want suffering in... I, I don't in need this the whole narrative. Yeah, but we don't get to choose our suffering. Suffering just... I, I didn't know like, suffering had flavors. She still wants to. It does have flavors, and I don't it's like It's just money. like Baskin Robbins. I want to choose my <laughs> exact flavor of suffering. Chocolate suffering. Only chocolate suffering. Only chocolate suffering. Going on <laughs> I'll have the pistachio suffering, oh, I get please. It. <laughs> it's Do pattern that. repetition. That's what I'm Can saying. Can I have that in a sugar cup? Repetition. Repetition. <laughs> Jesus I prefer Christ. my suffering without broken bones. That's all. Okay, you know what? Okay, boneless <laughs> suffering, please. That's a good one. <laughs> I'll have his suffering, please. <laughs> Make that too. <laughs> you you want hero heroic suffering? No, I want regular old life suffering. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> I don't want this pattern repetition over and over again. I don't want to replay the same thing in every fucking thing I do. Sadness is the way water dissolves old patterns. Yeah. So just cry a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's I've a done start. that already. Have the I mean, feelings. Feel the sadness. I'm tired of feeling sad. It gets boring after a while. Sadness then pivots up to brittleness and 16 and 17 and then drops down to sadness again. And then 16 and 17, brittle and back to sadness. Where's the sadness from? That's that's the younger age. That's the now you also like this is the space that you 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 are occupying at the moment. Because you can sit for a while. Yeah. And then the brittleness comes and the 16 year old girl comes back again and then you can drop back in so that seems to be like some kind of safety valve or some kind of right. way of avoiding getting any deeper but it's exhausting and that's what i'm saying i don't want to fucking do that and you're all like oh just keep doing it it's yeah that's hard. that's there's no there's no escape valve i mean that's yeah you can keep so looking for it but it's just not there you know the only way through it is through it not around it not going backward not not getting you know the, you have to eventually go through the sad baby long enough so that you can integrate it and accept it 
and move on or else you'll just uh, keep okay. going back. You're saying I have to embody it. I have to, I have to really feel it and it. own it. The longer you okay. can see a sad baby and, and not sort of get out to 16, 17 year old brittle and come back, that's, that's the goal. Here's an embodiment of someone who failed at doing it. <laughs> to give you an idea, it's hard, but uh, this is a common reaction. Now, now, no, because you're still thinking what you're going to say instead of what I'm saying. Now, getting right along. I heard what you well, were every, saying. You're doing it again. What you were you're saying. doing it again. I don't care. You're doing it again. It's wrong. You're you doing it again. Persecuted her for standing you're up. You're doing it again. Persecuted him for standing so this is mad baby right now. Standing up, the only change that ever happens is when people stand up. This is sad baby peeking out. How did I have a sad baby? Come on! No tears yet, but hmm. peeking out sad baby because she exhausted her anger and she doesn't have any outlet on how to expose her dominance and get sadistic supply. Mm. So. In the face of shame and futileness and frustration, sad baby peeks out. And what do you think happens? She shuts it down somehow because that's what people do. So when people stand out and I have a sad baby, too long. Martin Luther King Jr. And then she collapses as sad mm -hmm. baby. And mm -hmm. then the teacher or the ex experiment says, "This there's bigger suffering than your wani be bullshit. Junior was shot. Are you in any physical danger here? So Martin Luther King would, or, was shot. Are you in danger? She doesn't take that. She can't reconcile that she's acting out based on her flashback and her perception. And there's actually no danger physically. And it's an experiment that they all signed up for. <laughs> she's blocking that feedback and you see her turning and blocking it physically. And what does she do after she blocks it? Are you in any physical danger here? Is that girl in any physical danger here? Emma. So she is angry because her fantasy of the way the world should be is being challenged by this experiment. Intentionally and precisely by the teacher. And when the mm -hmm. teacher is doing stuff that collapses her way of how the world should be or the world was, she gets angry and tries to get the world back to something that's within her map of the world. And when she fails, she has sad baby come out. Right? Right there. Mm -hmm. Futile. Right there. Sad baby and collapses. But when Sad Baby doesn't work, or when Sad Baby is too shameful, she gets up and leaves. Right. Why does she get up and leave? Because most likely her mom or her caregiver, when she had Sad Baby, she got abandoned when she threw a tantrum. Mm -hmm. Or the mom when would get sad and would run away or shut down. So she didn't have models of how to embody sad baby and ride it out. So the trigger was the anger, the chaos of the world. The weight of the world is too heavy. Angry baby comes out. But then angry baby falls apart and brittleness, like Brad saying, comes in. So that's a warning that sad baby is about to come out. Mm. And then when sad baby comes out, She's shamed, or she feels shamed. She's self-shaming herself. And then she mm -hmm. leaves. Is that girl in any physical danger here? Emmett Till was hanged by his neck after he was beaten almost to death, simply because he said, made a statement to a white woman. So she's leaving because her map of the world is falling apart, and she can't update to the group's map of the world. Or she can't keep up with the group's exercise. She can't hold those two different worlds. That's called the uh, paranoid schizoid split. So the exercise is designed to break somebody and someone's going to break. 
and then after the break, a lot of people want to stop it, but that's slowly opening the door of Sad Baby. That with that person, she came back and wouldn't own her Sad Baby, so then she just left the exercise. Because owning Sad Baby, probably to her, when she was a child, meant death. Mm -hmm. meant caregiver would attack so she's associated mm -hmm. sharing sad baby riding sadness as danger mm -hmm. danger danger stranger that's like a really schizophrenic existence but that's the modern world if you openly cry in a park bench or in public somewhere what's going to happen someone's going to everyone's going to bypass you or they're going to come and try to soothe you and stop your tears I can be a semi-metaphorical boat person through the valley of death, but the boat person does not know where you end up. But what's the value of the rebirth? What do you get after that? Not me. You. I understand you what the get. fantasy is. I don't get understand you. the rebirth. You get you. You get more burdens, more suffering, more pain just in a different framing because you never escape karma and you never escape fantasy and delusion oh my god <laughs> you're not selling this very well <laughs> you never Death and like suffering <laughs> and hell and bullshit oh, it yeah. all sticks around it all sticks around you wrote this fantasy <laughs> That's what Everything sadness else. does. It ruins fantasies. I said, sakes. water dissolves <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> All right. But that frees you because you see beyond the fantasy. That's what you were asking. You want to see what's beyond the fantasy. <laughs> In order to see beyond it, the fantasy has to fall apart. So Pankaj is trying to rescue Iman. Oh. I'm not sure what Pankaj is. There's no risk. There's no risk. It's gone rogue. No, get back on the road. Where are you going now? Pankaj. It's assuming there's rescue. It's not rescue. We can't put everything in the one frame. It is like how the animals are chasing. Meta analysis. Yeah, you pivot a lot, Pankaj. Detached clockmaker type god figure. <laughs> you you pivot a, a lot. Deist. It's okay. <laughs> There's a lot in your family. It sounds like that you are losing control of that you've lost grasp of. You alluded to, and correct me if I'm wrong, a close family no longer being close. My youngest brother. Your youngest brother. So yeah, it's. Uh... And one thing Brad said, it was really, really cool. He said, look, if you want a relationship, but he, he has to want it too. I mean, it's just so simple. <laughs> How complicated is that? Adult to adult, yeah. What happened to your brother? To... He has just uh, some shit from my perspective, which was a betrayal. And from the family's perspective, it's a betrayal. Property issues. Money. And who did everybody side with? It wasn't just uh, money, Adif. It was more uh, trust. trust. Money Main and trust. trust. Yeah. Betrayal. Betrayal. The family sides with what they see. They've, uh, you know, he hasn't been to the like mum's seventy fifth. Uh, you know, things like that. So the family is very clear. So these are these things, like, uh, but it was so beautiful, like last, you know, like you said, like, it's, it's like this and you have to grieve and how long that takes, it takes its time. Yeah, it's cool. So he's been a big benefit to America because people will see what the Democratic yes, Party is like. Yes, your brother. Yeah. So your brother Trump. and you. So your in the brother. same way, my brother, but he is not, uh, he, he was like more um, very. He stabbed uh, you in the back, not in the front. Complicated. Yeah, but he long stabbed way. you in the back. Did he? Did he Very stab you in the back? Painful. Was it unexpected? Yeah, it was unexpected. You didn't but, see it. No, you see, the thing was, I if if I was uh, if I didn't have the blind spots, like we we discussed. You it. can't face the pain. You can't face the pain because as soon as the pain comes up, you have to intellectualize it. Right. I understand. I do Ooh. this. I do this. I constantly do this my entire life because I have a very high IQ. No, no, no. You, and I have you, the ability to do that. You asked me a question. It's the easiest way to avoid the pain. You asked me a question. I was answering that. It happened suddenly. I said, 
to mm -hmm. me at the time. It but she's trying like to bring up a point where you're trying to stay on a narrative of control or trying to understand it a certain way. No, no, no. Betrayal, no, no. brother. <laughs> betrayal. Those two words, brother. Betrayal, brother. Mm -hmm. Betrayal. And this is two people That's... that are reflecting a right. point that they see that they sense that you aren't able to uh, face. So that's why they're amplifying. No, when when you said, uh, did it happen this. suddenly? So to me, it seemed it happened suddenly, but it was happening for a long time, but I, I was just in unaware of it. Yeah. In retrospect, you can look back and your smart brain can go, oh, this step and that step and that step and that step. If only I would have recognized, but you didn't. Because these things are in, you didn't. Hindsight is Can't go back in time. Hindsight is always 2020. I have so much better vision now than I did 20 years ago. If I knew now, if I knew then what I, you, it's not physically possible. You have a smart brain, but it cannot see the future. Your brain cannot see 20 years into the future. Your Pankaj's brain 20 years ago could not see every step of what would happen. And there's no physical possible way you could have seen this coming. You could only see it looking back with all the puzzle pieces together now in a beautiful frame that you that that fucking rips your heart out. So that's why what I feel and beginning to feel more is that that was the friendship in a way because that's what helps because the pain is what gets you to see who you are. So the knocks are actually your friends. It still doesn't describe the betrayal and the brother. There's oh, a betrayal yeah. here that came from someone close yeah. and that you trusted. Yeah. But what happened, Anikron, was that this betrayal thing, this my this how I tell my narrative, but it's moving more towards that that's his that's his karma. He has to do that because he's that's how he is. And but that's how does that make you feel? You see how you know, you're like, responding how like K? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, I'm completely lost with, when you're when you're talking to me on every so. time they're trying to direct you to your feelings, you're pivoting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Nahama like was able to really <laughs> capture that emotion with like intensity of her experience, and then you just pivot mm -hmm. and get away from the feeling. Because Pankaj, what happens if you feel that feeling in front of all of us? What would that, what would that look like? It wouldn't look like talking. I guarantee you that when your brother, your blood brother stabs you in the back and twists the knife, pulls it out and stuffs it back in. It doesn't look like talking. It looks like fucking tears on the floor. You're a man who is broken in front of other people. That was, that was, that was last week. That was last week. That was last week. <laughs> this okay, so I, yeah. So, so how does exactly what uh, Because said. the thing is, this is the speed of it. If you understand that model, that there's a narrative, there is the message under it, there's the emotion under that, and under that is the assumption. You're so explaining. Look, you're so explaining. Oh, talk about that. you. He got it compartmentalized, and he doesn't want to open it. assumption. Right. How simple right. is that? Like it's not complicated. We're making it complicated. Just have okay. wrong. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, let me let me let me share a story. I, I, I need you know. I'll share a story with you guys that is similar. So, okay. So here's what happened. I finished high school in '93, right? And I started writing my aunt, who was here in America, um, about coming to America to pursue a career in the arts. That's so from movie. 93 till eventually around 96, 96 or 97, my aunt sent a ticket, you know, home. So in, in, because in Imagine. between the, that in between time from 93 till when my aunt sent the ticket, I started playing basketball and made it on the state team. My parents knew that every at six o'clock every day you have to go train. I had to I had to go to the college campus where the only basketball court was to train. You know what my parents did? When I would go to train, they would call my aunt and tell her like, "You're making the wrong decision. You should send us the money that you're wasting on the ticket instead, um, because he's not home. We haven't seen him in weeks." Um, he hangs out with armed robbers. We don't know what he's doing. Is this who you want to bring to come live with you? So 
I found that out when I came here because eventually in 99, when I came here, my aunt was like, I need to come there and talk to him. And my parents knew if she came and found and I'm, and she can see that I just discovered like, oh, you did send a ticket. Why didn't they tell me, mm-hmm. you know, there would be a problem. So my parents then told me, oh, your aunt just sent the ticket. This is 99. I mean, December of 98. Okay. So when I found that out, that amplified the angst I was already feeling from leaving home and coming here by myself. You see what I'm saying? And look how long it took until now, as we're talking, is when I realized what that anger was. But I, I, there's, the rest of the time I spent suppressing it. So basically what I'm saying is I didn't have the luxury or opportunity to have a group like this, a, a group of compassionate people who are willing to hear my story and help me pull that anger out in a healthy way, way back then. And all these years I've been living in this country, you know, so consider this moment, like, you know, take advantage of what you have here. It's just what, four of us here or five of us here. Like I rather, you know, for me personally, I would rather work, you know, dig it out and feel the pain here than to keep suppressing it and allowing it to come out in a way where it will end up triggering shame afterwards, which you explained before. You you know, you said you felt. Yeah, felt it. So I felt it on Monday and Tuesday. That's what I was trying to say, that this model that we are learning here about the faulty assumptions is that powerful. That's what I'm trying to say. It is that yeah, it, t- it takes it takes time, but you know, like again, this is a moment where mm-hmm. you're slowly realizing, like, oh, there's this compartment. Like, we're you see how honest we are by saying we're telling you to your face. We're not yeah. gossiping about you. We're telling you to your face, like you're trying to intellectualize. And so, when we're talking to you, that's why it's this back and forth is the compassionate way to do it because in society, they won't consider that because they're not even hearing you. They don't give a fuck about what you're saying. So they go, oh, here he goes again with his lecture. Okay, what is Pankaj gonna say this time? And that's how they're reacting. And then that makes you mad. And then, you know, it just never, the cycle just keeps going. I was hiding my angst in so many different things like, and then it started showing up in my work, <laughs> you know? So like I, I play ball, that's a very aggressive sport, you know, basketball. So people say, oh, yeah, you take that anger out on the court. It wasn't working, but I would fake it like it is. The anger was very deeply rooted in betrayal. How can my parents betray me like that? You know what I mean? But that's where the anger was. The anger wasn't, you know, by default, I'm playing ball and letting loose of that physical anger. but. Mentally, there's a deep rooted anger. And when I finally came face to face with it, it was my, you know, where it was angry baby, it was not no baby. It was a big fucking 20 foot monster that I met. And I'm like, this is who I am. Yep. So I, I agree. Um, last week, um, when Brad was talking and everyone was talking, I, I, I nearly broke down. I, I couldn't stop stop my tears. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't do it. And then um, they all held a space and stuff. And on, I was saying on Monday, I just, I just, I just no energy. You know, just no, can't go to work. Can't do work. Tuesday the same thing. And then, then I just broke down. The wailing is death. It's death of your for, of a part of yourself. It's a death of the part of yourself that thought my brother loves me unconditionally in this way. And that's part of my identity. It's a death of, I thought my parents loved me this way. The wailing that you hear, it's so haunting because it is death in action. You're hearing it physically. It is death. To experience that on your own even is very scary because you are 
physically embodying a death of a part of yourself that is terrifying because you don't know what's going to be left. If you allow that death of yourself to come through, that death of the, the, the past self, oh. you don't know if you're going to be left with anything. How much of this was a part of me because it was so fucking much. And how do I know it was so much? Because it hurts this much. If it didn't matter, it wouldn't hurt. If it didn't matter, it wouldn't hurt. If it didn't matter, it wouldn't hurt. You allowed yourself to wail in front of yourself. And that is a step. You allowed yourself to shed some tears in front of the group. And that's a step. To fully wail in front of the group, which is sort of what I feel like everybody wants you to do because it would give a release. But to do that is to embody and acknowledge the shame of, I don't know if there will be anything of me left after this wailing. If I allow you to see me embody a death of a part of myself, that is fucking terrifying. Of course, you're going to have all these, you know, assumptions come in and you're going to have all these that, that this is not a small thing you're facing. Now you've started to conquer it. You've taken some steps and maybe we're pushing. I don't know. It's not my place to tell you when you should cry and when you should. What I'm really learning again from this exposure therapy in this group is learning how to hold fucking space for someone to, you know, instead of when someone, soon as someone tells their pity story, I try to plug the holes like Nihama said, you know, I, I, it's not my place to plug those holes. Like, that's why the person is here. They're, they're here for the same reason. If we were all great, I wouldn't be here. If I had the answers, I wouldn't be here. But I don't. Yeah. If you express your truth and you're the scapegoat, the purpose of you being a scapegoat is for you to stay the fuck shut up, <laughs> to not express your truth, to not speak, to disappear and hide and stay depressed. <laughs> but if you continue to deny your expression, your soul feels like it's murdered. You're getting soul murdered by lack of expression, denied expression. So scapegoating is a way to dump sadness and pain into somebody else and to not acknowledge their humanity. And it works in a positive light. If you scapegoat someone positively as a guru, as an all good person, you do not acknowledge their humanity. You do not acknowledge their imperfection. You do, do not acknowledge their limitation if you project all good onto somebody. Just like if you project all bad onto somebody, you don't project, you don't acknowledge their differences and their goodness. Scapegoating is a way to simplify somebody else, play God, to say, you're the cause of everything. Good, bad, anything. You help me make sense of the world. So some people mistake anger for scapegoating. This is an example, trying not to scapegoat Brene Brown, but it happened to work out as a perfect example. Her own definition of anger. See if you see any signs of scapegoating. If you look across the research, you learn that anger is an emotion that we feel when something gets in the way of a desired outcome, or when we believe there's a violation of the way things should be. So this type of anger is only outer critic. <laughs> Can't you get angry at yourself when you don't meet your own standards? Can't you get angry when you have a bad plan? Why is anger only when you see an obstacle <laughs> outside? And why is anger only when there's some violation of the way things should be? <laughs> which is, there's a violation here, which is your mind just going to... Who's the violation? What thing or person is violating the way the world should be? <laughs> That's blame mode. That's fault mode. That's scapegoating mode. 
this is how she's describing anger from her book. Pretty cool. When we feel anger, we believe that someone or something else is to blame for an <laughs> Instantly, her definition when she feels anger, someone to blame. <laughs> Instead of saying, I need to matter, <laughs> what's wrong with a boundary? How do I fix something? How do I make things better? Who the hell do I point my finger is when she feels anger. And it's not just when she feels anger. She says when we feel anger. <laughs> so she's projecting her personal opinion onto the research and onto everyone else because that's her way of hiding <laughs> her norms. Blame for an unfair or unjust situation. What's unfair and just is based on a personal estimation. And unfair and just gets into envy and resentment and other feelings, which is not directly anger, but you can clump it all together to find someone to scapegoat because this is her description of how she responds to anger. It's just scapegoating. And that something can be done to resolve the problem. As a former union organizer and a lifelong activist, I think anger is often the most compassionate response to experiencing or witnessing injustice. <laughs> the most compassionate response. Scapegoating is somehow the most compassionate response to dump your pain onto other people. What the fuck does it have to do with being a union person or whatever she crapped on about? That's a social justice warrior. You're allowed to fight for a cause. You're playing God because you're saying the world isn't perfect enough. So I get an excuse to enforce my anger and dump it onto other people and use it as love. Yeah. <laughs> it's a way to reframe my anger, my resentment and scapegoating and call it love and social justice work and all this other stuff or activism. It can be a powerful catalyst for change that does not need to be explained or justified. Why doesn't anger and viciousness not to be need to be explained or justified? Don't challenge me. Because she's right. <laughs> she's always right. Because she's right, because she's playing God, because she's offloading her pain. What is that? That's... So much easier to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. So if you become a social justice warrior, you're allowed to offload your pain, scapegoat your pain onto others. So you don't have to deal with your sadness. You don't have to face reality. You just spend all your time invading other people's reality, and then you say, I'm setting boundaries. <laughs> or you can even say this, like, you know. I had done nothing wrong. Don't call me a liar. Don't call me a liar. Don't call me a liar. Don't call This me alone a liar. creates cognitive Don't dissonance. Call me a liar. So if I'm lying to your face and creating a tall story, and I get angry at you and just tell you, don't call me a liar. Don't call me a liar. Don't. And then I tell you this. Don't, don't say this isn't real. Don't say this isn't real. How the fuck are you supposed don't to respond to that? Real. Don't say this isn't real. Don't say this isn't real. If she just stonewalls don't this in your face real. for three don't hours, <laughs> just keeps returning don't to this. this don't say real. I'm lying. Don't, don't say, say I'm. This isn't, this isn't real. real. Don't say this isn't real. Don't say this isn't real. How are you supposed to respond? <laughs> we hate you. We hate you. We hate you. That's it. Oh, you could do that. You could just hate her back. <laughs> we hate you. We hate you. We hate you. <sighs> but unwanted identity. So <laughs> she's defining that anger is a catalyst for change. Therefore, it does not need to be explained or justified. 
<laughs> and I still think behind the anger is a tempest of pain, grief, betrayal, disappointment, and other emotions. <laughs> She even owns that underneath the anger is sad baby. <laughs> That's scapegoating. But if you get angry and dump your anger on someone else, you're inflicting grief onto somebody else. And you're transferring temporarily or partially your pain and sadness, your pain, grief, betrayal, disappointment onto somebody else to contain, to feel, to process. That's why it's so amazing to use scapegoats. You get to feel empowered because you're playing God, social justice warrior. And then you can transfer your pain, grief, betrayal, disappointment, repetition, compulsion, onto somebody else. But the other person now is in the burden of feeling your pity, but doesn't have the story. And then would scapegoat you back. That's a trap. So you get scapegoated. <laughs> then you scapegoat and demonize a person who scapegoated you. You play God too. Now you're in resentment and you have an emotional cord. You have a spiritual contract. You want to get even. <laughs> Give them back the, the crap pain they gave you. <laughs> The abuser is always running, right? Or they have a stone wall that just says, Don't say this isn't real. Don't say this isn't real. Don't say this. Don't call me a liar. Don't call me a liar. Don't call me a liar. And they're aggressive. Don't. Never wanted to be seen as a victim. Nor have you? I ever called myself one. Never wanted Every to be seen Every time you try to victim. Nor have give I them ever pain, they will one. just Never aggressively attack you. Never as a victim. Nor have you? I ever called myself It'll make your mind turn. It'll make your head spin. Oh, that sort of fits. Or they get angry. Is this supposed go. to be healing? Is this supposed go. to be healing? Is this supposed go. to be healing? It so Brene Brown intuitively describes scapegoating right. Underneath the scapegoating and the anger is a bunch of pain, grief, and betrayal. But because she doesn't investigate her anger, it can be a powerful catalyst for change that does not need to be explained or justified. She's not fully using the catalyst for change <laughs> to work out the pain and the sadness and hold space for the depressive position so that you get the real catharsis. By covering it up, by not explaining it, not justifying it, she's scapegoating. She's just transferring one pain to someone else because that's her method. She owned it. So much easier to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. So if you build the muscle to be sad, you flip it. Sadness is your superpower. Sadness is your gift. Sadness is your power. You're, if you own your sadness, you're owning your capacity to change. You're owning excess reality and truth dumped into you. Which means it's going to take a lot of work to sort through all the excess truth and reality that's been dumped onto you, scapegoated onto you. But if you sort it out, now you can use that sadness to just move gravity. <laughs> sadness is weight. Sadness connects to your soul. Sadness would allow you to just own space or create space out of nothingness or something. You need someone to be a sadness master. Misery is a doorway. <laughs> Man, all, all my maps are shit. I'm fucked up. <laughs> You're burning in that flame behind you, man. Uh, all, all of the fucking maps, all, yeah, the, all the diagrams, <laughs> all that shit.
It's burning right behind you, know you what? right there. And, that's and you know what, an air con? <laughs> an air con, not, hell, one of these, not one of these fucking bastards on this call dived in to rescue you. What a bunch of assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there is progress then. Somewhere. Thank you. Exactly. No rescue. Right, and and that's uh, and and that's the thing. And that's, like, it's not that's respect and honor, and that right, right. Like I, I'm, I am sad, you know. So it's yeah. like that's, but the fact that you know, the no reason one. why there's no rescue is that I'm not dumping it indirectly no, I mean, or directly on on you. Uh, like it's my own responsibility. You're owning this it. is my. I'm You're owning, owning it. it, and we're not it picking is it up. My sadness. Just there, like I just feel it in my stomach, in my chest, my throat. Like it's just sadness. It's not. Um, I refuse to intellectualize it. I'm not gonna. I'm not looking for answers. I'm. I'm just. What is this? This sad fucking dark cloud. Let it be. Let, yeah, just. That's how I'm feeling. And. It would. And again, maybe th there is something to learn from it, but I'll allow it to teach me what it's supposed to. I just want to say, fuck the world, man. Right now, that's how I feel. Fuck the world. Fuck it. I didn't ask for this shit. Misery is a doorway. I didn't come here to work this fucking hard just to be alive and Go about my business. So fuck it. I'm, I'm you know, it's okay. <sighs> Jesus fucking Christ, man. <sighs> Life is about misery. Yeah, Your misery, amazing. other person's misery. It's all misery. That is so fucking sad. I don't matter. God, this is depressing. You need someone to be a sadness master.